Williams. He also served as an administrative assistant to the Attorney General of the United States. During his tenure at FBI headquarters, he served in a supervisory capacity in the administrative identification and inspection divisions. He also served as an administrative assistant to the Attorney General of the United States from 1975 to 1976. In September of 1977, Mr. Clark was appointed Assistant Special Agent in Charge of the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania FBI Office. He returned to FBI headquarters in December of 1979 to serve as an inspector in the inspection division. In May of 1980, Mr. Clark was appointed Special Agent in Charge of the Kansas City FBI Office. He was designated Deputy Assistant Director, Criminal Investigative Division at FBI Headquarters in May of 1982. In July of 1985, Mr. Clark was designated Assistant Director of the Criminal Investigative Division at FBI Headquarters. As Assistant Director, he had responsibility for the major investigative programs of the FBI, which include terrorism, organized crime, white collar crime, civil rights, property damage, uh, property crimes, undercover operation, narcotics and dangerous drugs, and violent crimes. In February of 1989, Mr. Clark was designated Executive Assistant Director for Administration. His general areas of responsibility at that time included the FBI budget, personnel administration, resource allocation, long-range planning, and FBI policy development. And in July of 1989, Mr. Clark was appointed Deputy Director of the FBI, and in this capacity, he's the Chief Executive of the FBI with day-to-day -day operational oversight responsibility for all of the FBI programs, and he advises the Director on strategy, planning, and policy matters. He's responsible for the administration of issues across divisional lines and chairs the Senior Executive Service Selection Board. Ladies and gentlemen, De Deputy Director Floyd I. Clark. Uh, good morning. It's a uh, real uh, honor for me to uh, be here with you today, and I am enthusiastically looking forward to the uh, next two days. And as, uh, as we heard this morning from uh, Director Sessions and uh, Deputy Attorney General uh, George Terwilliger, uh, the, the focus is on uh, finding ways uh, to reduce uh, violence in, in our society. And we have a tendency to, to find uh, fault or quick solutions. And uh, law enforcement uh, becomes the, uh, uh, the, the, the target for uh, both the criticism and praise in dealing with uh, violent crime. But as we all know that the violence in our society is, is a cause and as a result of many more things than just either good or bad law enforcement. That we need to look at our homes, our communities, our churches, our neighborhoods, as well as the civic and business and educational and law enforcement structures that, uh, that exist in our communities. And over the next two days, we're going to hear a variety of views. And... Uh, different uh, solutions and approaches, some that have been successful and some that we might want to adopt and build upon that will have application to our individual communities. And we have a distinguished group of participants and we invite the full participation uh, from those and we need to look to find ways that we can be mutually supportive of each other's uh, areas of responsibility and try to find ways to bring uh, all of our resources uh, into focus to build a partnership in our communities uh, to deal with this terrible uh, problem that is uh, confronting our nation. Uh, several months ago, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, participate in a program when I heard a very enlightening and thought-provoking uh, presentation by Dr. Dr. Deborah Prothro Stith. Uh, Dr. Stith <clears throat> is a graduate of Spelman College and of the Harvard uh, Medical School. She is uh, currently the Assistant Dean 
for government and community programs at the Harvard University School of Public Health. She's also a lecturer for Health Policy and Management Department. She is the former commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Her professional initiatives have focused on adolescent health and have included strategies of community education, health edu education, media campaigns, and research and evaluation. She founded and directed a community-based violence prevention program which continued her pioneer work in health education for teenagers on anger and violence. The curriculum she designed, Violence Prevention Curriculum for Adolescents, has become a national model. She has been a consultant for several school systems and departments of public health. She is the author of a book on adolescent violence entitled Deadly Consequences, which was published in 1991. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Deborah Prethro Stiff. Good morning. It is with pleasure and hopefulness that I share my ideas and thoughts with you uh, this morning. I am pleased because the dialogue between public health and law enforcement is one that I want to encourage, and this is such an opportunity. I am hopeful because this complicated and overwhelming problem of violence in America requires new energy, new responses, and new relationships. Your focus on community involvement at this meeting makes me hopeful. It's an opportunity for new energy, new responses, and new relationships. I am a physician. My interest in violence as a health problem started when I was a medical student. I really apologize for uh, having to uh, cut that off. That was uh, a very uh, interesting and thought-provoking and stimulating dialogue. And uh, I think if there was ever any question about the partnership between uh, public health and law enforcement, it certainly has been addressed. And it also stimulates our thinking and understanding that the civic and educational and political ramifications of these issues are also part of this equation that, uh, that we have to consider. I also uh, want to note that the uh, book, uh, Deadly Consequences, uh, as a, well as the uh, book uh, of our next uh, presenter will be made available uh, for each of us uh, to take with us. Our uh, next uh, presenter before the uh, lunch break is uh, Dr. Robert Trajanowicz, and Bob is an individual who the FBI knows quite well that he has worked with us in a number of areas over uh, quite an extended period of time. and. He is the author of the book, uh, Community Policing. Uh, he's uh, recognized both uh, nationally and internationally as an expert in the field of uh, community policing. Bob is a professor and former director in the criminal justice program at the Michigan State University. And uh, he's a research fellow in the program in criminal justice policy and management in the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He's been the director of the National Center for Community Policing since its, in, since its inception in 1982. He holds a BS degree in police administration, a master's in social work, and a PhD in social science, all from Michigan State University. He's had uh, vast experience uh, working with a number of uh, police and social agencies. He is the author of several textbooks, including the one that I just mentioned, Community Policing, A Contemporary Perspective. And so it's with uh, great pleasure that I introduce and give to you uh, Professor Bob Trajanowicz. In many respects, it was pointed out earlier that we're preaching to the, uh, to the choir, and we really are. And uh, my comments here, uh, some of you have heard before, some of you are way beyond what uh, what I have to say, and, and there are many teachers right in this room, you chiefs of police, who I've uh, learned so much, uh, much from as I travel around the country. 
it's always nice to give my presentation and uh, leave and go back to academia. I don't have to deal with the, uh, with the wars out there on the streets. And I have really learned from you. Uh, one person who's not here that I've uh, learned even more from was my father, who started policing in 1929. And that's where I learned my community policing. So that's going to come through in, in my talk here today. Uh, I didn't learn it from a textbook. I learned it from a, a feeling level, if you will. Uh, what also will come through is uh, we're not talking about a panacea, and we're not talking about magic. It's hard work. It's a complicated problem, as Deborah has pointed out, and it's going to take a lot of commitment. Uh, I try to break it down into ten basic elements. The first element of the ten that we're going to talk about briefly today for the next 40 minutes or so is a philosophy, and you've all heard this before. Community policing isn't a project. It's not a police community relations unit, if you will, where we want to humor the patient and not cure the disease. It's a philosophy that says the customers of police service really know what's best for themselves. They really know their communities and their problems. They know how to solve problems if you ask, if you involve them, if you have a relationship with them. It's a philosophy about the worker, if you will, the police officer who's delivering that service, that he or she is smart, they're intelligent, they're creative, they're innovative, they want to go to work if they're allowed to do some problem solving and if they're allowed to feel good about themselves. And it's a philosophy about the police managers who have to go out there day in and day out and deal with the political factors that, that exist in our communities. It's a philosophy that says the police manager is a leader in our community. The police manager doesn't just deal with the mundane issues day to day with the police department, that he or she has an overview of what the community needs and how those services should be delivered and a commitment to make sure that the community is going to be better off when he or she leaves that police department than when they started. Somebody's on the phone that has a question for you about community policing. I said, Armella, I'm late uh, for my meeting. She says, he only has one question. I said, okay. So I walked over to her desk and I got on the phone. And the person, well-meaning, says, I'm the new captain of patrol and uh, I just came from the investigative division and we have three exper experimental community policing projects. And I have one question for you. I said, okay, shoot. He said, what should they be doing? <laughs> well, uh, obviously I said, I'll get, I'll get back to you and I'll send you about 20 publications and, and we'll have a more extensive dialogue. But the point being made is, is sometimes communities get into this community policing thing and not understand the overriding philosophy that, uh, that uh, has to take place and the implications it has and the reverberations throughout the organization all the way from the time a person is recruited till the time they retire from that department. The evaluation system, the promotion system, the field training system, the training orientation that those officers get. So it's a very complicated process and that philosophy has to permeate the entire community and the department, if you will. The second element is we feel community policing can enhance accountability. It breaks down anonymity. And it breaks down anonymity, obviously, of the predator we want to know who the predator is and where they're slithering around in our communities, where they're causing us havoc and grief. And it's a very small percentage, quite frankly, who can wreak havoc in our communities. But more importantly, it breaks down the anonymity of the community. It says to the community, we're not guns for hire. This isn't the OK Corral. And we can't solve the problems in our neighborhoods without your cooperation, without your communication, without your real partnership, if you will. You can't be anonymous and say, we have the local rapist who may be over there, we have the wife abuser over there, but I, I really don't want to get involved because you know, I have a part-time job, I'm tired out when I get home. You do it, cop. You be my garbage collector. And it breaks down the anonymity to say to the citizen, we'll go halfway with you. We'll ask you your opinion. You nominate the problems. We'll get involved together. 